that one. Um, I definitely designed all the fucking shirts up there, and yeah, there's a bunch of shit around here. All right, we're joined this hour by Leo Martinez, who is a comedian, an artist, a uh, design maker, uh, self-described uh, adult, adult with ADD. So, uh, Leo, before you got involved in all these things, and before you got involved in the myriad of things that you're involved with in, 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 in the designing uh, of um, of so many things that we're you know we're, we're getting into details of, how did how did this get started? Where did your interest in uh, in just making things happen uh, begin? Uh, I think the two hugest attributing factors to me turning out the way that I did and dedicating myself to the shit I do, one of them is my mom. She's from Mexico City, so we were we were, uh, we always went back there for the Christmas breaks, and then later on in fifth grade when my parents got divorced, they would send us out there for the summer. So that city had a huge influence on me, but also the type of personality that my mom has developed from growing up in that city is something that definitely got carried on with, with me and my brother and my sister. Um, so that was a huge influence. But then the other huge influence is that when she did move here and when she did raise us, we grew up in a mostly white town. She um, hustled her way into a good housing situation, even though we were definitely low income and she cleaned houses for most of my for most of my life, which also meant that I when spring break or summer break or things like that were going on and we weren't off in Mexico or we weren't doing things or there's a day off of school for whatever reason, we were cleaning houses, we were restoring apartments, getting ready to get re-rented to new tenants. We were doing all the manual labor that uh that we couldn't just sit at home so that part and then the second part was like i said growing up in a white town um in a mostly white neighborhood middle class white neighborhood so the aggression of of what we're seeing festering up and blowing up right now on a nationwide level that is like all this 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 uh simmering aggression that white america has always had and has always lashed out like i grew up in that environment so i also seen like the most liberal of the liberal and the most aggressive of the aggressive and just everything from cops telling us not to ride in certain neighborhoods and keep it on the main streets to teachers and the way that in when i would look back at it as an adult and be like why did she hate me so much i'd be like oh yeah yeah, she hated me because I was like the only Mexican kid in her fucking class. It's like, so it's a lot of things like that too. Also, like the bullying that came from a lot of the kids um, that came from the, a lot of the white kids that would gang up and shit. Like, I I realized that I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that was the first time that you'd get all the racial epitaphs hurled at you and the ones that you didn't even know what they meant at the time because you're in like fourth grade. Um, but also that's what gave me a really sharp tongue. And by the time I hit middle school, I was really quick to clown a motherfucker and talk a lot of good shit. So that's also kind of how that developed. And that was the early part. But also the other beautiful part of what later on led me into organizing is that growing up, my mother had always taught us a great deal of respect for Cuba. Um, she would obviously be watching stuff on Univision, uh, Primer Impacto, things like that. So every time Jorge Ramos would come on and say some gusano ass Miami shit, she would call him out on that. And she would be talking shit about Miami gusanos regularly. So I grew up understanding the context of those class struggles, but more importantly, of like the resilience and the resistance of what, what Cuba was able to do. And later on in 98, 99, she was the one that explained to me everything that was going on with Chavez and Venezuela. And which is ironic because now as an adult, I recognize that my mom is like a, a Hillary Clinton Democrat, but she has an understanding of movements of resistance through Central and South America, right? So that's the shit that I kind of latched onto and ran with later on in the years, but it's it's definitely something that I'm sure, but also she was down to fucking argue on behalf of um, that's why we got the Defend the Elotero artwork right there. That was uh, part of a campaign that we had later on, but really it come, it stemmed from watching my mom when we were, later on when we moved to the hood, she would see the cops fucking with the corn vendors or fucking with the street vendors. She would park wherever the fuck we were, leave her car running and go outside and just argue the fuck out of those, argue the fuck out of the cops on the defense of the corn vendors. So she was able to keep a lot of their shit from getting thrown out sometimes, but then sometimes she would have to fucking, uh, she would lose those arguments, but it was always normalized to me to argue with cops on behalf of others. And it wasn't until I, later on I became older that I was in like later high school or a little bit older that I, it wasn't so much arguing on behalf of others, it was more arguing on my behalf because I was a fucking 
Mexican teenager. So it, it's, it, it was already always kind of in the wheelhouse of where we were used to operating in. So do you think that your own personal experience of having um, like kind of like lived in like a middle class kind of white neighborhood and living in the hood and like kind of like being kind of like jerked around like the whole like, you know, socioeconomic uh, strata of the country. You think in many ways it kind of like demystified um, the, the economy as a whole? Because I have a very similar experience like, of like growing up in like on the east side and like my, my mom remarries in the suburbia. Then I, then I, you know, go out and live my life. I end up homeless. So I end up all the way out. And then like um, before that, though, I was working with my dad who had like made a bunch of money with this small business he was running. Um, and so like, you know, we were like sitting like three seats from Mark Cuban or some shit. So like he'd like, hey, you know, because he was always starting failing in businesses and shit. But what one finally really took and all of a sudden next thing he's got tons of money. Um, so I've been yeah. like, all over the economic strata, but that in many ways, like it, it just completely like it, it, none of this is like a mystery to me. None of this, is, I look at this, I'm like, how can it be done? Or I have no, you know what I mean? Like, so, but I don't credit that to my own intelligence. I credit it to my experience, which is like. Yes, yes. I think that's the important part. I mean, now as an adult, I've been running a sign shop for a few years, but I think that's the most important part is that it demystifies. First of all, you get to understand white people on a whole other level that um, a lot of my organizer friends in Oxnard that grew up just around Mexicans and just in, in Mexican spaces don't really understand. They weren't exposed to, to that level of white people. The only white people that were around them that are middle or high upper class people that were around them were usually teachers or some type of authority figure, not teachers specifically, but like some type of authority figure in some environment that they were at. So it de definitely demystified the economy. And then also it let me know really early on when we would show up to either clean some rich lady's house or some rich dude's house or something like that, or just working with contractors that had a good amount of money. And you had some of these conversations or they'd have conversations with my mom and my mom would like pick their brain, but kind of hack it shit or just kind of pump the brakes when they were trying to like pull one over on her. It made me realize very early on, you're like, oh, okay. These motherfuckers aren't smarter than you. They're definitely not smarter than my mom. They just have more resources available to them. And once you said, once I started seeing it from that perspective, I was like, okay. So then it wasn't necessarily so much of a, a stressful thing. The uh, I didn't fucking I dropped out of high school senior year. I mean, I went until the very last day. I had woodshop projects to finish. But the point is. Like I was never worried about what I was gonna do with the rest of my life or how I was gonna make a living. That was never one of the concerns that I had. I just always assumed that it would be a small business of some type that I would run because my mom always ran a small business. And that was always, it was very normalized, whether it be um, money coming in, money going out, overhead, um, things of that nature were very much within the wheelhouse of, of what I was capable of doing. I fucked around for a few years there and we were, we were mad lazy and slacked, but nevertheless, it was, it was never really much of a stress on that. It was more stress keeping up with all this shit. Once you get it going, that's where the stress comes in, not how it's going to fucking happen. But yeah. Yeah. So this whole story, where does it take place? I mean, it doesn't take place on the moon. I mean, where, where, where are you? Where, where are you coming from? Ventura. Yeah. Most of it's Ventura, Ventura, California. Um, yeah, most of it's Ventura, California. That's where everything is born and raised. But as far as organizing, I organized almost all. I, I'm not going to say almost exclusively, but the bulk of the organizing goes down in Oxnard because that's where all my fucking that's where all my people are at. That's where everybody's that's where the Mexican population is a little more dense. But that's also where all my fellow organizers just by coincidence end up living or end up staying in the bulk of them. So. And ever since I was a kid, we were always going to Oxnard. It's the next town over. So it's it's very normalized for me to be within those spaces and always be out there. As a whole, everybody just kind of represents 805. But I specifically give a lot of love and spend a lot of time in Oxnard because that's where, I mean, just by coincidence, we're in Ventura. But that's because I set up the shop in the neighborhood that I kind of grew up in. That, and I like it here. But if I were ever to move from here, the first two shops that we had before we moved here were in Oxnard. So... I have no problem going back, but yeah, it's all within this eight hundred five area. It's on the Ventura area, Ventura County area. So, so uh, you know, this is designed hopefully eventually for a, a wide cross section of society. And so, uh, when people think of Ventura, um, who aren't you know from Southern California or even people from Southern California, I mean, oftentimes they just think about like the, if anything, maybe the song, you know, Ventura Highway or something like that. They don't really, yeah. uh, they don't really get a um, an idea for 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 what what uh, what Ventura. Oxnard, um, the divide between the two, what that's really like. So can you can you describe for us a little bit about 
about well, it's a crazy yeah. fucking divide because on on paper when you show up you're like oh ventura it's a really dope beach city downtown ventura they closed off um they closed off a lot of the streets so that they could do in the street dining right so when you look at it from that perspective you're like yo ventura is a super cool little chill it's like a medium-sized beach town and it's very welcoming and there's a lot of hiking trails and things like that which is true but oxnard's the powerhouse of this county oxnard's the biggest city in the county and most of that is like 87 percent mexican hispanic latino and then there's a filipino population and then there's a small black population too but the powerhouse is that most of oxnard is working class so they have to go to ventura to work in all the restaurants to work in the fields that ventura has they have to go to Camarillo to work at all the factories and all that. And the other part of it is that because of all the agriculture around here, Ventura County, so many strawberry fields, so many orange fields, so many avocado fields, the labor for all that has to come from somewhere. So it comes from Oxnard, it comes from small little towns like Santa Paula and Fillmore, but also that's what that's what brings in the 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 low income working class. That's why we have gentrification happening in the apartment complexes where a lot of people are at. So you combine that, and the reason Ventura has so much money is because they own all those fields, but also because we have one of the largest military bases on the West Coast right here next to Oxnard. So because of that, you have all these international defense contractors that are wreaking havoc across the globe that are north of Grumman, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, Monsanto. They all have headquarters around here somewhere. So then that means that if there's a bunch of missile manufacturers they're contracting out to a bunch of little small CNC operators that are that are independently owned and operated throughout the whole county. And that's where you hire um, these first generation, uh, these first generation Chicanos. And that's where you hire like the undocumented or that like the people that could do the factory work. So you have a you have a a, a base of people that are capable of doing a good amount of manual labor in a variety of different fields all supporting the agriculture industry dying at higher rates because of the pesticide exposure, but also supporting the defense industry because of what you have going on with the defense industry. Yeah, yeah. Can you um, hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Um, broadly speaking, though, I don't think... A, My bad. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. My computer went to sleep right now, and now that I opened it up, my Firefox window won't pop up anymore. You're still on. All right, cool. Well, if you can still see me, then that's all that matters. If so you, you have that, you have mad agriculture, you have a bunch of defense industry shit, and that's the tomfoolery that we're used to. So you have a like a, a very contrasting view of the county, depending on who you ask. Yeah. So, you know, uh, um, I don't think that, like a lot of people know, I mean, just how um, – it's kind of a mystery to most people. or not. It's kind of not even a mystery. It's, it's something that's just unknown. Um, just how deeply segregated the entire California coast is, like yes. Santa Rosa, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, yeah, um, Ventura. Like, can you speak a little bit to just, just, just saw, like how deeply, like segregated these places are? Like, it's kind of like apartheid in paradise, you know? Yeah. It is. It very much is like apartheid paradise, and and I never thought aggressively too. I never thought too much about the segregation, but it's definitely there. People from Ventura, people from Camarillo, white middle class people, they there's there's a common hate for Oxnard. There's a common like, oh, that's some ghetto shit, blah, blah, blah. Like there's a common and it's so much that it's internalized in Oxnard's own people that they don't party in Oxnard. Everybody goes to downtown Ventura or everybody goes to, you know, all these other spots. So there's definitely that. And it's just something to where I think over the course of the last, I think that door's locked. Oh, okay. oh yeah, here's the keys though. No, sorry, I didn't go around. All right, cool. I was just looking at it. Yeah, um, my bad. It's uh, it's something to where you see those dividing lines, but you see also where there, it's never so much a point of conflict. It all, at the end of the day, it always comes back to class struggle. No matter how densely populated Oxnard is with black and brown people, it's still run by white people. It's still run by upper middle class white people that are trying to bring in new developers and all this other shit. Like 
Oxnard is one of the last cities on the West Coast that's somewhat still affordable. Ventura is one of the last cities on the West Coast that's still somewhat affordable, and that's disappearing fast. Yeah. So yeah. I think over the course of the next few years, we're going to see some real hard battles, not only on the gentrification front, but also on the, especially now with the coronavirus and the economic shutdown, on the around projects that that have accountability towards government officials, but also where I'm trying to focus my energy now is on projects that build either sustainability or autonomy. And no matter how small or how large, it, it has to be a shift in the way that people think because out of necessity, they're gonna have to fucking do it. So all I'm trying to do is support projects that do that and try and interconnect them with other people that are doing similar projects. Yeah. So let's talk about let's talk about uh, the warehouse. So where did the idea of um, of the lab? Where did, before you got a chance to open it up? Before you got a chance to get everything operational? Where um, where did um, where did this idea come from? It was uh, I was doing sign work out of my dad's garage when I was younger. I worked at a body shop in Oxnard, and on the side I would do sign work because I got a vinyl cutter and a few other things. But once uh, once I left that situation and decided to, to focus my full time, I wanted to make shirts. That's all I wanted to. But once I got the vinyl cutter, I was like, oh, this makes signs and stickers? Fuck shirts, man. I don't even like shirts that much. I still do shirts to this day. But um, it came from a few friends that, had, that were selling graffiti supplies out of a little shop in Oxnard. They were already selling graffiti supplies. I have a history in the, within the like the graffiti world. Like that's the background that I kind of came from. So when they started getting into trouble for selling to underage kids, because they were themselves younger and underage, they were like 20 and 21. I was already like 24 at this time. I had already outgrown my dad's garage and I thought it would be a good idea to work with them to pull them in and then pull in my brother who was a musician and always had his little studio area. And he was younger than me too, he was like 20 years old. So I ended up being the oldest one. But I was like, hey, if we find a building and all four of us go into this building, then we could split the rent four ways. And if we split the rent four ways, then it's not stressful on any one of us. And that we could like collectively work in a space where we could sell spray paint, even though we restructured the way that it was, that way we, weren't, we made sure we weren't selling to underage kids. And where my brother could make his music and where I could like keep making signs and doing stuff like that. So we found in one of Oxnard's hoods, we found uh, a bar that had gotten shut down a year before for meth. And uh, so the, we worked out, I worked out a deal with the landlord, with the realtor there to where we would fix it because they'd cut pipes, they'd cut all kinds of, they'd fuck, they'd fuck the place up before they moved out. So in exchange for six months rent, we got the air conditioning running, we got the pipes running, we got all these things going, we got it all in tip top shape, repainted everything, repaired all these things. But during that first month before we opened, the other two friends that we had originally, that we were originally gonna start this with kind of fell by the wayside when they realized that there was real work that had to go into this shit. And then it was just me and my brother. And, uh, and what really radicalized me politically, because even though I'd always, like I said, I'd always been paying attention to what Chavez did and this and that, and I'd gone to protests here and there, but I wasn't actively participating in, in movements. Um, what really radicalized me was that first year at that shop, because from the very first time that we had our grand opening, I tried to be proactive and go with the cops across the street that they would hang out at the gas station and be like, hey, my name's Leo, here's my card, here's what we're trying to do across the street. I know it looks like there's graffiti stuff in there and this and that, but I'm trying to put my best foot forward and let you guys know that y'all are more than welcome to, you know, come fucking talk to us. Here's my cell phone number. We also did that same thing with the neighborhood. We were in the neighborhood. We know what the impressions are going to be like. So we handed out flyers through the whole neighborhood. There was a bus stop in the back. And we also let all the kids know that there was free art classes every Wednesday that my brother was doing. So it's, when we showed up every time we've ever showed up to a community first we do outreach within that community we don't reach out to cops anymore for shit we learned our lesson a long time ago but one of the things that the cops started doing is they started showing up randomly and taking pictures of the inside of the shop and i was like yo 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 like I, i'm we're doing this out of good faith like we don't need you guys in here taking pictures of our shit and then after that they didn't like it so when we started having our first grand opening and we started having little musical events here and there they would start showing up and that's when we started getting raided and then that's when they'd start like we would abide by all the rules. And because it used to be a bar that had live music, we were allowed to have live, loud music. We had to keep it 
closed before 10 or after 10, we couldn't do any loud noise, but that's fine. They were all ages shows. There was no drinking. There was no nothing like that. Yeah. And they would just constantly yeah. be fucking cracking down on us. So that's where it not only did our line of defense become fortified, but that's also where I started working with Elliot and a few of the members of the collective and a few other collectives that were organizing around Oxnard because they always needed a place to do stuff at. So we always opened up our venue to be able to be that spot. And, um, and it was something that just snowballed from there. The following six, seven years after that was like a low intensity warfare with the sheriff's department and code enforcement of them always trying to crack us down and bust us for something or do something. And us just standing our ground and fortifying our defense lines and going on the offensive sometimes to aggressively push back against their bullshit. So by the time that that kind of all simmered down, I said, all right, now I'm ready to get into community organizing because now I don't have the pressure of the fucking cops off my on me anymore because we threatened them with a few lawsuits that made them back down real quick. And then that's when I started organizing on the offensive. And that's when we got around um, police brutality struggles for accountability. That's when we got around um, all the anti-ICE actions and trying to develop systems and networks tapping into what the collective already had and just providing my resources and my brainstorming ideas for that too and and that's where it kind of fucking grew out of that yeah tell us a little bit about uh uh elliot gabriel and uh and uh, the, the organization he was with <laughs> elliot gabriel bro elliot's one of the downest dudes smokes a bunch of cigarettes just listens to death metal shit but Elliot's one of the downest dudes that I ever met. When I met, it was him and Chavo. Him and Chavo were the ones yeah. that were were like the most visible faces of the collective called Todo Poder al Pueblo, which had organized originally around um, immigrant rights and police brutality to begin with. So that's how I met Chela, actually. Chela came out to perform at one of their events, and I fucking I loved what she was about. So from the get-go, I was always like, yo, whatever you need, homegirl, I'm here, I'm down. Um, and that's how I met a lot of other cool friends, too, within organizing spaces was through Elliot and Chavo. And that's where we always threw support behind their marches and their events and anything that they had going on. Um, and then in the later years, when I joined the collective, Chavo had already left. Chavo had just left, I believe. And Elliot, I ran into him at some action in, at the military base. Oh, when all the undocumented kids were showing up at the border and they were getting redistributed amongst all these military bases and government housing. 90 of them or like a hundred and something of them were sent here to Oxnard. So we went out there. I went out there because they were doing like some welcoming, like a bunch of maybe Democrats or something like that were organizing like a nice peaceful welcome or try to provide services and church groups there. We're trying to make contact with kids and things like that. Um, so that's where I ran into Elliot. And I think the Alfonso Limon shooting had either just happened or it was right around the corner from happening. But that's really what was the catalyst that made me get more aggressively involved in what they had going on. At first it was just providing them with like flyers and doing printing stuff out and doing shirts for them. But as I saw how they were doing things and how, as I saw how my schedule was looking and my things were lining up, I'm like, all right, I could show up to some of these meetings. I could show up to some of their brainstorming shit. And at one point, like, yeah, once the cops are finally off our ass, I was like, yo, Elliot, I'm down to join. I want to be a part of this collective. I want to be a part of this. Um, and that's where the organizing kind of started happening. So I'm very lucky that I was able to have a mentor like him and dudes like Chavo and people like Elsa, which I we, I still communicate with them regularly. But it was beautiful to, to have them there because it was never, not only was there never a dull moment and everybody got along, but it was also something to where you had this this can you i got to tap into like a collective struggle that has existed in the area for quite some time already and get to know who was doing what and kind of what that some of the histories were of struggles around around oxnard specifically and then elliot got a job at telesur he took off to ecuador and then from there i convinced him to go to mexico city he wanted to go to costa rica i was like oh the metal scene in mexico city is more your vibe and on top of that you're gonna have a bunch of people showing up there throughout the year because it ends up being a central distribution point to all the other states around Mexico. So everybody usually just flies into Mexico City. Now he hates it. Now he's like, bro, dude, everybody just wants to show up and they want to go to the pyramids. And I've been to the pyramids a million times. And it's just like, I feel like a tour guide now. And it's not even, it's like, dude, suck it up and enjoy it, man. You'll be fine. <laughs> but, uh, 
But I was like, oh, I'm complaining because I live in one of the dopest cities and there's all this cool ass food and I got to show all my friends around. Wah. No, I fucking love him. I rip, on, I rip on Elliot, but I'm super light on the ripping on Elliot. I love that dude. Yeah. Um, yeah. As yeah, so Elliot's a cool character, and then when when he left, the dynamics of the collective definitely changed, um, because we did have some younger, more reckless kids in the collective, and then just off of age and experience, I fell into the opposite end, which was um, some of the older folks that had experience in organizing, and I was always like, I was, I always tried to take the best of both situations. I always tried to take the best of what the older organizers were saying and being like with, with their approach to things. And then also take like the, some of the more aggressive, but manageable tactics of what the younger kids were proposing. And like, Yo, let's marry this shit together and let's go about it like this way. And that worked out well for a while. But the truth is without somebody constantly there every day doing the homework, that's the thing about organizing that nobody talks about. Everybody talks about organizing, but nobody talks about how much stupid homework there is to get any of a million simple things done on a large, on a, on even a local level. Like all the things that you have to, conversations you have to have in meetings and fucking, because then it just becomes a bunch of ambulance chasing, right? And that becomes stressful because I don't want to be an ambulance chaser getting stressed out waiting for the next police brutality shooting to happen. It's like you got to do some proactive shit. But also recognize that when the opportunity arrives, already have something in place that you could push for and get some support behind. It's exhausting. Yeah. And none of that is the sexy stuff. Running right. around, masks on and screaming is fucking fun, but it's it's not the tangible on the ground work that makes change. Yeah. So it would seem that over the past, like, uh, there has been um, kind of a dip in, um, in, in point emphasis and points of an approach um where you know like mm, analyzing the material conditions and then trying to like uh, change them is not the point of emphasis now the point of emphasis has become something like you know trauma or harm reduction self-care right now of course like you know taking care of yourself yeah. like for now is uh you know that's an age-old wisdom right that like you know hey man take some time for yourself whoa you're gonna you're, you keep going with this you're gonna crash that kind of stuff is like you've always done that but like this, the, the centrality of taking care of yourself and making sure you're okay has really seemed to take over a lot of a lot of organization activism in, in in many many places. Have you kind of experienced this? And what would you, what do you what do you think the 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 the, the impact of that is? I understand it. I think that what, and here's what I feel that is missing. All right, Leo's frozen because it was getting too good, and they don't want you to. They don't want you to hear this. <laughs> I'm gonna try and refresh. See what happens. Oh, he's gone. All right. Well, hopefully, uh, Leo is able to rejoin us in a moment or two. I mean, I uh, just. Uh, Gonna wait for him. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna drop some links. Uh, uh, yeah, you should check out the Lab, 05, uh, Lab 805. Pretty cool. Um, you know, really amazing. You've got that that warehouse is, produces a lot of stuff. Leo's, Leo's a pretty funny guy. He's a comedian as well. I'm gonna drop a link to some of his uh, commit comedic uh, enterprises. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Lab eight oh five. There's a good there's a good video on, on YouTube about um about uh about the warehouse. I mean I don't know how up to date it is, but like it's pretty like pretty solid. on here <laughs> I 
<laughs> what an unfortunate face to freeze on. For Leo. There's a link. And give us a minute or two more. And uh, if Leo's unable to rejoin, we'll have to just reschedule. So just kind of kind of wait it out. Tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> See, Martin's got some questions there. That's good. We're uh, see if we get Leo back on to address it. Um, give this a minute or two more. All right. Well, I think I'm gonna call it. Um, so this is gonna be uh, a conversation with Leo part one. And as soon as I get back in contact with the, the good the good sir, we'll have to we'll do a sec. Oh, is that him coming? No. All right. Uh, and when I get in contact with the good man, we will do a, uh, a follow up. So, thanks for tuning in. This has been um, an impromptu with Leo Martinez, part one.